Uh, you're all very, very welcome to this being human event. Um, and as David said, it's uh, one of several taking place throughout Belfast, and there's more information about the other ones um, that are happening over the next couple of days, this week in fact. Um, today's particular event is called Storytelling from Conflict, Lost and Found Stories, and the Prison Memory Archive are really pleased that we're part of this Queen's Initiative. Prison Memory Archive is a research project within Queen's University Belfast and we work in close collaboration, which I'll touch upon in a moment, with the Public Record Office, Northern Ireland. For those of you who don't know, the Prison Memory Archive is a collection of about 175 interviews with people who passed through the two prisons, two of the prisons during the conflict troubles, uh, Armagh Jail, the women's prison primarily, and the maze in Long Cash. And that's inclusive. The criteria that we used in those filmed recordings, and some are available online if you want to see them, the first one was inclusive, uh, sorry, co-ownership. It's really important in terms of participatory practices that people, when they tell the story, continue to feel that they own and jointly share authorship of that story. The second is inclusivity. So while we all are aware of, through popular culture, the Republican story uh, of the prison, there are also other stories that complement, contrast, challenge, question that narrative, and they're all of equal validity. Prison officers, loyalists, teachers, artists, chaplains, etc. And the third criteria we used was life storytelling, in that we didn't push an agenda. We didn't tell people what to say by asking leading questions. We allowed people, in the spirit of co-ownership and authorship, to decide what it was they wanted to talk about. And some people talked for 20 minutes, some people talked for four hours. In fact, it was one of those very rare occasions where we had to kick two prisoners out of the jail in our mad jail, and they said it was the first time it ever happened to them. <laughs> um, so that's the Prison Memory Archive. And what we're going to do today is explore the the site itself. Not so much those individual stories, we've done a lot of work on that and we'll continue to, but the site itself, because this site is rich in material and uh, non-material culture. And we have two really interesting speakers, uh, sorry, three interesting speakers from two perspectives. The first one will be Sarah McDonough, and that's the workshop primary that Sarah will be leading. And that is for partially sighted and blind people, because access to these stories is crucial. There are, of course, very varied interpretations, very contested interpretations of what happened in that prison. But actually, we need to reach wider than that and think about accessibility. How do people get access to this? And so Sarah is going to lead that workshop, and your participation in that will be really appreciated. We then have Janet and Graham from the Public Record Office talking about another layer of meaning within the site because this existed, this site, way before um, it became a prison. And of course it continues to exist and have a presence partly by its absence, the lack of an international reconciliation centre, which I won't go into, but also it's a Burmora site. But before it, was a, it had a series of existences which they will address, and there are some maps up here which they will point you to. So, that's what's going to happen today. But for your information, we filmed in 2006 and 2007. The 300 hours of material has been sitting, waiting for someone to fund us to make it available publicly. It's been difficult, it's a difficult subject. And we finally um, got success a year ago, um, the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, Heritage Lottery Fund a year ago gave us the money in collaboration, a partnership with the Public Record Office to move the entire 300 hours plus all the other material that goes with that, all the emails, the letters, correspondence, artefacts um, into the Public Record Office which we're hoping will happen in about a year's time. Um, so that collaboration with the Public Record Office has been crucial and it will be available within a year. We'd like to thank um, the Public Record Office for being a partner and we'd like to thank the Heritage Lottery Fund for making it possible and today we'd like to thank I think it's three organisations that have helped sponsor um, the Being Human Festival. The first one is the 
SOAS, the School of Advanced Studies at the University of Ulster, uh, London, sorry. Um, the second one is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the third one is the British Academy, all of whom funded uh, today's <laughs> event. So once again, oh yes, one word um, about photography. We have our team um, will be taking photographs, or at least one of our team will be taking photographs, and then towards the end of the event, Northern Visions Television, which is a local community television station broadcasting in Belfast, want to come along and do some filming. They'll do some cutaways, and then they'll interview two or three people afterwards. And I believe the Press Association will send a reporter along at some point. That's less important because that's written text, but if anybody does not want their face to be shown on television, uh, community channel, or uh, on our social media site, Facebook, whatever, um, could you raise your hand now and we'll try and remember who you are and make sure that doesn't happen. Perfectly understandable. Okay. Thank you. And remember your jumper. Okay. Um, so, uh, without any further ado, I would love to hand it over to Kate Keane, who I think has been uh, outstanding in terms of organising today's event. Over to you, Kate. Hi everybody, my name is Kate Keane and I'm the archivist working with the Prisons Memory Archive. I'd like to thank David Huddleston and Cahill for giving us our first introductions there. In slight contrast to what Cahill has said about our running order, we're now going to have Janet Hancock from the Public Records Office up. Um, Janet is the Deputy Head of Public Services here at Promi. She's going to speak to us today about online resources um, that can be used for any local history research you might be interested in. But Specifically today, looking at how they help us to build a picture of the site at Maze and Lockett. So please, Janet, if you come up, thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And before I even start anything, I'm going to caveat by saying I'm working on the live internet. So I cannot be uh, guaranteeing how well the speed will work. But uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about basically are a few of Prony's resources uh, that you can use to explore local history in general, family history in general, and I suppose a lot of what you're going to be talking about later will be based around the site and, and the prison and how uh, Maze Long Cash was used in its latter years. I'm just going to do a bit of signposting onto some of the resources you can look at to see how it had a life before that and obviously a lot of people focus on one interpretation and one narrative and see what they know and understand but perspectives as has just been touched on by Cahill can be very different and equally equally accurate from all sides so hopefully this is just going to give you a little bit of insight. Um, in terms of Prony, uh, David mentioned that we have archives. We've in excess of three million archives here in Prony. Um, the majority dating from the 17th century onwards, although our earliest dates back to 1219. Um, I'm going to be showing you a little bit of uh, namely maps and valuation records and some of the sources you can use to see how the maze has been used in, in previous years. So first thing I want to do is signpost you to the Pony website. Uh, this is our homepage. We've lots of informational material on here which can help you get started if you have a look under your research. If you have a look under what's on at Prony, you'll find out about talks and events such as this. Can everybody hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Um, and also, I just signpost you to our YouTube channel. Uh, we video and record quite a lot of our talks and lecture programs. Loads of stuff on topical interest, history, of local <coughs> history, of family history. Really good starting point if anybody just wants a bit more general information. But what I'm going to focus on lives up in this top left-hand corner of the Prony website and it lives under Search Archives Online. <coughs> and the first one I'm just going to go into is our historical maps viewer. So I suppose people and place are interlinked. Um, and when you click into our maps viewer, You'll get a little bit of background information. Uh, these are based, this is a collaborative project we did with the Ordnance Survey. So the Ordnance Survey began officially mapping the country in the early 1830s. And we have the Osney Archive here. 
and we work with uh, what is now Land Property Services to digitise those and to make them available. So if you click on search, it'll take you into our Maps Viewer. Uh, and as you can see, it just starts you off on our homepage where you can see an overview. Uh, and up in the corner, there's a search box. Now, I'm going to be searching for Mays, which is the townland. So I'm sure some of you may or may not be familiar with historical land divisions, but a townland is the smallest land division, uh, the, the sort of smallest standardised land division. Uh, and Mays falls in under the townland of Mays. And it's quite difficult because to get it on screen it's quite small. But when you search, you can search by townland and parish because this is most of our records are actually organised geographically because they weren't created for us to access for family and local history today or, or study. Most of them are created for an administrative process. So you can see Mays falls under the parish of Blaris. And if you search and click on the correct parish, it routes you into the townland of Blaris. So, you see, internet, don't fail me. So when I click on somewhere in that townland, you'll see a little blue ring highlights around the townland boundary. And if I zoom out, you can start to see there's your townland of maze. And if you click the little arrow in the top right hand corner of the pop-up, it tells me that the maze is in the parish of Blaris. And if I zoom to that, you can start to see whereabouts in the parish landscape that townland exists. And obviously this is something that's pretty important to townlands, particularly parishes, both as a religious uh, setup and as a, an administrative setup are, are significant. So if I go back into the townland and start to pan in, what you can do in the map sphere uh, so there are a number of base layers. One includes the aerial imagery. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Google Earth, very similar to Google Earth. I'm not going to load it because it will, my internet's bad enough. But under the layer list, you'll see a list of maps and you can start to layer on your historical maps. Uh, and we can see here immediately, uh, there's the racetrack and you can actually see here if I close that in this area, oh, hang on a little. The main, that's the main site, which is agricultural, uh, rural landscape at this point. You can see things like gravel pits, blind key bridge, and one I thought was particularly interesting, the long cache with a C, noted on the, the first ordnance survey map. So you can immediately see how names not only are, are carried through from historic periods, and the long cache is not a townland, but the Ordnance Survey standardised townlands, and even when you go locally, you'll find place names, even down to the name of a field that people know locally. And I thought that was an interesting one to note. We have points of interest, and I'm just going to zoom in. You can see the little school hat, for example, if I click on that, and browse through. Oops. May's school. Uh, again, we have school records uh, for this particular school. Um, and you can see that that school has been there since the 1830s, and we have records carrying through. And actually, I have some of these records. So I've got the first edition map that you're looking at now over in the corner. I've got the school registers for that school set out. And also, I've got uh, the Griffiths valuation map. So Griffiths Valuation is a land valuation taken basically in the middle of the 19th century. It lists heads of household and what it also does is overlay uh, plots <coughs> across this and you'll see from the valuation map that's on the table if you want to have a look later, uh, you can actually work out uh, from the valuation revision books. Oops. Uh, I'm going to show you how that works. So the valuation revision books are something we've also digitized. So if I go into the valuation revision books, look for the townland of Mays. 
Browse forward to page 38. Five, 36, 37, 38. You can see here we're in the townland of Mays, and you can see uh, along the left hand side of the image, if I pan in, the plot numbers. So you can actually take that plot number, and I think from looking at the map, the plot numbers in that very specific area run in and around the sort of 16 to 20 plots. So if you just browse forward, you can see names of householders who were actually located on that site. And just clicking quickly back to the maps, uh, you can move forward through your editions and continue to overlay. And you can see that those fields have actually been drawn in more closely. And I'll just finish up with this one. Uh, and you can actually start to see the actual site uh, and that's that's from one of the revisions taken in around the 1930s and you can see the airstrips have been laid out uh, if I pan it a little closer one of the other things that we have lifted are the historic uh, sites and monuments record from the historic environment division and the little blue dots and again, you can see noted here RAF Long Cash Airfield and World War II defensive features. So I'm conscious of time and I don't want to uh, overrun into anybody else's time, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavour of the kind of uh, material we have. And all I'm showing you at this point, more or less, are things that you can do online. Uh, I've got out some of the originals that you can have a look at. What I would say is if you're coming up to look at the originals don't bring any tea or any food with you, hence the barriers, but come and have a browse through and you can see some of the original material. And the other thing before I finish that I would just point you towards is our electronic catalogue. Um, and the easiest way to describe the, cat the catalogue is it's a bit like Argos. Everything we hold has a unique reference number and a description telling you a little bit about what it is. Um, so whilst you can't click through and see the original record, you can go into the catalogue and you can have a look. And I'm going to just type in maze. And So there are 424 references to maze, and I'm just going to go forward a few, just to highlight some of the early stuff. You'll see in the valuation revision books that it's actually located on the Downshire estate. So if you want to take this a little bit further back, uh, you can go right back in through the Downshire archive, which we hold and you can get back to maps of the area. Uh, I can't find it, but it's in here somewhere. Dating back to the 1790s. Uh, so if you, want to, if you want to really explore the site and the people who lived here, here's just a few examples of how you can do so. Uh, very simple access, free access to Prony. Uh, you just need to register as a visitor, you bring your photographic ID, you'll get a visitor card. Once you're in the search room, you can ask any of the staff for a bit of help and they'll point you in the right direction. Uh, but I'm going to wrap up there and pass over to my colleague Graham, who's going to talk a bit more about some of our more contemporary records about the site. My name is Graham Jackson, I'm an archivist in the Public Record Office. Uh, I'm the client manager for a few uh, departments, the Department of Justice, the Northern Ireland Office, um, Police and a few other agencies and I'm responsible for bringing in the records um, in those areas and making them accessible ultimately. So what I'm going to try and give you is a bit of an introduction to primarily the Northern Ireland Office archive which is huge. Also the prison archive generally, there's a historic prison archive um, and a few other things uh, that, that relate to the site. The bulk of what I'm talking about is the conflict area. Uh, area. Era. So um, Janice discussed the, 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 the sort of pre-20th sort of 19, 19, century. I'm going to try and give you a few images. If you've, at the, your table you can see the images I've, I've sort of passed out there um, of, of the, sort of the, the maze and the long case sites. 
Apologies, everyone, for the short delay. Just bear with me for a minute. Excuse me. Hi. How are you defining conflict here? Okay, yeah. For, the, for, for me, because he's talking about the Northern Ireland Office Archive and what's called the HMP, Her Majesty's Prison Archive, we're custodians for the government side. So we have privately deposited records here, so we have things from everyone solicitors who represent it, attorneys, we have human rights, political parties, all sorts. But for me, the business is in speaking for the archive we have, which is the official side of this. Now, I was talking to Joanna earlier about the notion of um, truth. The truth is another man's lies, particularly in, in, in a conflict area. But to try and answer your question, I'm talking about primarily Northern Ireland Office inception in 1972, when they took over from what was the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Ministry of Home Affairs, after partition, was responsible for running things that the Northern Ireland Office would, would have then taken over, security, policing, um, all, all that sort of heavy stuff, uh, uh, civil defence, that kind of stuff. So I'm talking really from my slides when we get them, uh, the Northern Ireland Office and the archive, which is a huge archive, so it's, it's a very valuable resource. It's got a lot of stuff there, but it, the essence is that you take that as um, as one part of the story. And, and Joanne very healthily summed it up in a previous talk by talking about truth as a, as, a, as a diamond, but there's many different aspects to it, depending on which way the lights shine. I'm talking about the official story. So from 1972 yeah. till... To, um, well, okay, so as an archivist we talk about historical records under the 1923 Public Records Act. Historical records kick in effectively at 20 years. So we would be receiving, expected to receive records when they're 20 years old. So when you're talking about, I'm going out, at the moment I would go out and part of my day job to, to <coughs> trace the records, to select them effectively with the department. So I'm going up to store them in various places and sometimes other departments um, looking at the old records from the early 2000s. So we are in the business of selecting those. I'm starting to get into, in, in my other hat, I release the records um, when they become 20 years old. So we're just about to release the 1992 files from the Central Secretariat, the Northern Ireland Office, Department of Agriculture, etc. That will come out at Christmas, and you'll see those usually in the Telegraph and the Irish Times and things. There's a bit of coverage there. Um, then, next year, 1993-94, and the, you know, in terms of the prisons, you know yourself, anyone here who, who was living at the time, um, knows that that's when the sort of government was starting to meet with paramilitaries and things like that, so files are really interesting. What you have for these guys in the Northern Ireland Office Archive is a fascinating insight from the bureaucrats and the officials. A lot of the papers revealed fascinating chess playing going on. I tend to see it as chess players. The, 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 the Northern Ireland Political Affairs Division, the Political Development Group, the, uh, the, the talks teams were playing chess over here with folks. And so what you can have is the files will reveal fascinating thinking into how we play John Hume against and um, bringing in Jerry Adams. Um, all that stuff. So you've got that underneath, and I'm sort of getting a bit uh, distracted. So what I'm going to try and do is, I'll answer questions if you have any, but effectively I'll try and take you through a few of the images and uh, talk about the Northern Ireland Office Archive, and then please contact me if you want, and I will explain to you. I'll get into specific areas if you want. Did you have some more copies there? Yes, of course I do. I actually brought lots, so I didn't want to cover your tables because I'm only one talk. So. Um, as the man said, in the blue theater, there are plenty of work which I made earlier. So, so there's some of the larger print ones I created, and then there's some A4 ones. So just in, and, um, obviously, what I'm talking about here, bear in mind that there might be people who are blind or partially sighted. For me, I, I, I can help you with what we have archivally, thousands of files. We're talking <laughs> shocking, shocking amount of files here and information. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is, realistically, we're the National Archive, we're primary source, we are maps, photos and files. I'm talking about these files, they're like telephone books, hundreds of them on the Northern Ireland Office alone. We can help, with, if people want to contact me, we can try and help as much as we can to get you accept, to access this stuff. Um, but there's a limit, I suppose, to how much, I, and so I'm conscious of the fact to the audience that I'll be referring to things that we're looking at in photographs. So if anyone wants to, to ask me to explain something more, please put your hand up. Um, 
on. So effectively, so I've explained probably, that's, that's what we are, we're the Public Record Office under the 2023 Public Records Act. We're the official place to deposit for all these records. One of my key areas is the Northern Ireland Office archive, and so what we have there is um, a lot of a lot of different types of files on different subjects to do with the maze and the long care site. Being a prison, it was an internment. It was a place. It was an official place of internment. Each end of a place of internment, long care at, at the time. Then, um, when the, the troubles intensified, they uh, needed to get a lot of people they were interning and um, effectively detaining without trial, but then also the, the, the offenders that they were, they were uh, taking through the court system, they had to get them into special uh, segregation. So the Crumlin Road and the, the Maidstone, the, the, the prison ship Maidstone were used initially and that was obviously not fit for purpose. Um, they moved them to the, the former airfield. What you have is a lot of different subjects. Hopefully, there's a little list there I've given you a pot shot. Okay, so, yeah. um, some of the issues are education, obviously important for the prisoners. The, the prison system, irrespective of the, the political status of the prisoners, they were, they were trying to keep the education going, trying to educate them. Uh, the Open University was active in the prison. Um, religion. Religion was a big issue in terms of um, not only the, 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 the identification and segregation of the prisoners, but also the... Um, the, the religious uh, affiliation and the fact that they were able to express their religion. So there was some, there's some files relate, re, relating to that. Um, some fascinating visits files by the different people they were visiting. Not only were their families and their political representatives visiting them, um, you've got the International Committee of Red Cross, you've got Amnesty, Board of Visitors, the, the, the journalists, clergy, politicians, all these people come in to visit them. So you've got these very detailed visitors files on the issues about the site not just the human rights aspects, but the physical conditions um, and, and, and all the things that prisoners actually do complain to uh, to visiting committees. That's what they're, they're part of their role is. You've got the massive issue of the special category status protests, which became started with the blankets and the dirty protests, and then became awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So back to the slides. Um, Thanks for that's your patience. Thanks, Kate. So, um, special category then ended with the hunger strikes. Um, we have files on the legal issues, very complex legal issues beyond the special category status. European Convention on Human Rights. Um, the, the, there were other things to do with the prerogative of mercy and early release and humane release. Uh, we've got the actual physical aspect. I know this. This today's uh, event is largely focusing on the physicality of the place. Um, you've got the accommodation and building works of the compound and the cellular HMP maze, cellular and compound. You've got all the 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 stuff that was I say day to day prison. It is also bear in mind it was a political prison that you've got the incidents that were not normal, but you've also got the things that were happening in many prisons uh, even today. Major incidents, minor incidents. Uh, violence, riots, death, escape, protests. Um, security is a big issue, particularly in the last number of uh, releases we've had, certainly in the mid-80s. There was a massive uh, um, investigation into strip search protocol. Um, the, the, the notion of, um, particularly in the female prison in Armagh, um, that uh, strip search was inhumane, it was a breach of human rights. And then this, the flip side is you've got the Northern Ireland Office trying to justify uh, search for explosives, search for weapons, search for illegal correspondence commands from their, their external um, organisations. You've got the tunnels, you've got hopefully some of the images I'll get to now. Um, we'll, we'll show you some of the tunnels, uh, particularly from the mid-70s. Censorship of correspondence, huge issue, where they were trying to interpret letters that were seemingly addressed to family. And you've got the NAO trying to, the, their intelligence people trying to sift and work out what, if, if Uncle Jim was actually Uncle Jim, or was that a, a, one of the, 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 the command structure in the paramilitary organisation. You've got the big, the, the higher level stuff, the minister's briefs and secondary state cases where the politicians waited them. Um, Royal Prerogative of Mercy, as I said, parliamentary questions where different, uh, different politicians were getting involved in the, 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 the sort of the uh, situation of the maze. Campaign for loyalist segregation. Use of Irish literature and language again, something common at the, at the moment. 
um, was raised at the, head at the time, certainly with the issue of uh, Irish language Bibles was a big problem at, the, uh, for, at one point for the MAO where we're trying to ascertain if the Bibles were actually going to contain codes in them. Um, so they had to, they were wrangling about that one. Okay, so some of the images then. These, a number of these images relate to a, and I think of, um, it was about six months before I was, after I was born, 19, November 1974, 33 uh, Republican inmates escaped the compounds. This is not the so-called Great Escape, this is the, the 1983 escape was when the, the likes of Jerry Kelly escaped. This one was earlier, this was after a, um, they'd uh, destroyed some of the compounds and, uh, in October, and 33 of them escaped through these quite detailed set of tunnels. I took some images here from various, uh, this is the HMP archive, you've got the RUC Scenes of Crime archive, and you've also got the actual MAO itself took photos. So you've got the sort of sandbags here under the beds, sandbags in a cupboard. One of the tunnels, that's the tunnel there. I'm pretty sure that was the tunnel exit. They tried to get out there after causing the distraction here and destroying the two compacts. So this is obviously from a helicopter. This is from a helicopter, I'm pretty sure, because they already see looking up at it. Um, that's just a quirky one out of one of the files. Um, the, 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 it shows the rainfall, and they were trying to work out when they were sighting the place. Uh, they actually worked out it was quite a swampland. And initially, the feedback was in terms of the physicality of the place and the assessment of is this going to be worthwhile? Because they were looking at McGabry, they were looking at a number of other sites, they were looking at some former airfields because of the security that had already been established there. And they were deliberating about this and, and trying to work it out. And in, in this letter, this is part of a letter. It's very detailed, but it's basically gone through the pros and cons and the political factors in, in terms of citing a special prison on an airfield and also the notion at the time, which is slightly depressing at the time. This was 1973. What they were saying was, rather optimistically, this hopefully should be a temporary situation. We'll get these people put in here temporarily and that'll all become normal. It'll become a normal prison. And, you know, when you see the date, like a lot of these archives, it is quite grim because you, you realise that it was there for a, bit, a wee bit longer. That's just a little official map with the sort of military and the Northern Ireland office plunking their various things that they want on this site. You know, the army maintenance, the army hangar. They had, obviously, the army were sited there to protect it, protect uh, or to stop the prisoners escaping. There's a weather station. This is one of the really interesting ones because this is the official maze assessment of the site at the time. So you can see here, there, ground conditions very bad with a high water table. The, the people then assessing it then were thinking, hadn't th they were thinking the physicality, yes, this is not good. And someone actually mentions, this will be no good for prisoners football. Ironically, when it came to tunnel building, as a colleague told me, she did study the archaeology of the site, the tunnel building was actually subverted by the fact of the high water table. So some of them had to, and in fact, one of the tunnels, I think a loyalist tunnel, they, they, the soldiers found it by the lights shining through from the swampy ground because they'd been so close to the ground. The lights shone through in the army kicked the, 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 the tunnel in with the guys still inside it. So, uh, you know, ironically, the disadvantage here at the start of the site turned out to be uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, positive for the animal and like negative for the prisoners because it was much harder to get out. This is one that I can't actually find this in one of the files he was going through and uh, I have never seen this before and I don't think my boss had seen it either. This actually was this little thing here is one of the officials, I don't know what level he was at, discussing a multi-story maze. This was like a multi-story, like I'm, I don't know how many floors they were saying, <coughs> that there were going to be lifts inside it. And clearly it was, it was what well, they talk about, the shots design. And it's quote, unacceptable to ministers. But um, they were looking at this thing being much bigger than it was. And they even say, high cash. And this thing was going to almost look like a tar block maybe five, six stories high, which is um, slightly strange, but that's what they were initially looking at. That's the plan as it, as it was. From Janet's map, she could do, if you got in your head, what, what the historical maps looked like. That was obviously the, the map as they laid it out. Some slightly unusual images from the information, government information service. This was when they rolled out the new uh, uniform, which was civilian friendly. And I think, I'm assuming that's a prison officer. Um, he's, he's, uh, modeling, and that's the, the quote, the new uniform, which was very um, 
catch you. That's the workshop with actual prisoners. You can see actually the chap. There's a chap in the top left hand corner with his face rubbed out by the Northern Ireland Office official because they took a photo and, and these were uh, the prisoners in one of the compound workshops. That is I'm pretty sure people were living in this one because there's, there's little handmade lollipop sculptures. So that was theoretically someone's, someone's living, but fairly new, obviously at the, at the, the build of it. Big workshop in the compound. A different escape, just that's from the Her Majesty's Prison Archive, so it's the HMP. And that covers some of the older stuff, but it does have some slightly more recent in terms of you know, the Maze era. A lot of it's more to do with the Crumlin Road jail, uh, Derry jail, and uh, Armagh. Some of the correspondence then, it's very detailed in the Northern Ireland Office files about the actual where they're going to put the prisoners in the new, these new H blocks, the cellular, Maze cellular. And uh, in this one, you've got a letter uh, actually from the secretary, well, it's to the Secretary of State and the private secretary. Uh, discussing, it's discussing the different wings and where the loyalists and the republicans. And in another letter, you've actually got some deliberation from the officials about the sub split of the problem that you couldn't just say republican and loyalist. You had to, they had to uh, take care of the fact that there was INLA and UVF and UDA, etc. This one, uh, this is a piece of correspondence where the officials were saying the handicrafts, as much as they had a duty to educate, there was an issue regarding illicit materials being either created or stolen from the handicrafts. And they noted that in the Great Escape, the so-called so Great Escape of 1983, most of the, the wounds were inflicted by handicraft tools. Um, that uh, you can, There are four instances there where, where the, the official notes camera it's hidden inside a handicraft and a table with fake legs, etc, etc. It's the kind of thing that um, clearly was being done in the handicraft because they edited, the prisoners saw it as a duty to escape. Um, on the flip side, the prison officers were trying to discover this stuff, so it was an, an, an ongoing sort of battle of wits. I mentioned the education, so this is a, a note just from the, uh, to the governor, noting that the loyalist non-conforming prisoners, NCPs, there was a duty still to try and educate them because some of them were, they, they, as they noted here, were, they were saying um, four inmates concerned that they're on protest but they're depriving themselves of educational opportunities. So the Open University was, was effectively still concerned with the prison service and saying, listen, is there some way of getting these people into classes while they were on political protest? A letter here from August 1984 is just to the undersec parliamentary undersecretary is noting the closure of the compound, the Nace compound, and the move to the um, the full move over to using the cellular setup, which is seen as the modern, obviously the new uh, model. There's a note here. Uh, this is a note of a meeting between the Secretary of State and the Security Committee. This is post the Maze Escape in '83, and when Sir James Hennessy did his very detailed report on the physical situation in the Maze, what went wrong. A lot of it was to do with things that, uh, almost like the horses bolted, they were looking at issues where security gates, um, different types of security gates, who got through, with the, the so-called airlock gates and all this. Um, so they, they were trying to, as it says their security procedures had been tightened. And uh, so they were trying desperately to, I suppose what would be called these days, a lesson learned. Lesson learned report on the maze escape and Sir James Hennessy was tasked with, with looking at that. This one, and finally, um, to end on a slightly surreal but slightly higher note, was um, one of our favourites. Is after the Maze Escape, a ten-year-old kid in, as we we have redacted his name, a ten-year-old young fella in England somewhere, watched the news, and as he says there to Mrs. Thatcher, he said, "This brought me to think how we could stop this in future." So he then suggested to Mrs. Thatcher. Um, the maze maze, which is effectively... <laughs> now this stuff's familiar to me because it's a wee boy I used to draw castles and you used to spend hours doing the bricks and I could see this wee fella doing this and that's just what I used to do. But he has thought it through. He's got the maze prison in the middle and he's got a maze of walls around it and he's even got a security camera I've watched her with a guy, a wee, a wee gun and even a door for in theory people being allowed out at some point. <laughs> And what I don't have here is the, is the response, which is actually the, the most heartbreaking part of the whole thing. 
The wee fella got a letter back from the from Thatcher's uh, private secretary in the most officious way, saying, "Dear Master So and So, thank you for your letter of concern." But the, Sir James Hennessy has instituted his report. We're looking into the physical, and it's like, my God, he's ten years old. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, could you just have a wee bit of humour with the fella? Um, but the, the, obviously the parents must have looked and just gone, gone. But yeah, that, that was the suggestion. Never was implemented, and the rest is history. So uh, I have overrun. Apologies for a bit of the mix-up there. But um, what I would say is, I'm here all the time. If you want to contact me about any particular aspect of this, you want to do some research on, or if you've got a question now, I'm not too sure if we're, if we're doing questions now, but certainly... And I'm happy to, but thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Duane Dennis. I'm the project manager on the Visual Voices um, project, um, which Cal spoke about the Prisons Memory Archive, and um, just there at the at the start. Um, we've heard a lot uh, so far. Um, this event is slightly different than ones that we have run uh, previously. Um, it's obviously part of the, the Being Human Festival. So whenever we, we sat down really to, uh, to start planning the, the event, uh, we started thinking about layers because one of the key aspects of the Prisons Memory Archive is about inclusivity, so about the need um, to listen to all of the, of the different stories, but it's really interesting, um, we asked there, what's Maze Long Cash, what's your meaning? Um, I don't know whether you just didn't get the chance to put the post notes up, or whether, um, because it is such an emotive subject, um, maybe that's reflective of that. So if you are willing, um, before the, the end of the, the day, to share that with us, we would certainly be very, very, very interested. So, um, yeah, I suppose being human, um, we've stripped back in many ways the, the human stories today, um, the Prisons Memory Archive, the, the, the light um, really up to now has been shown on the 175 audio-visual recordings of prison officers, um, prisoners, family visitors who pass through. Um, and what we're, we're going to do now is start to look at the uh, audio-visual recordings. Um, however, before I do that, I'd like to open the floor um, for questions. I see um, Janet's not with us anymore, but... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Yes, at the back there, Diane. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting. But I'm curious, from a blind person's point of view, with regards to the map views. Um, <clears throat> you said, oh, you know, you were talking about Janet was talking about clicking on this and clicking on that. It was at all possible clicking on those drop down boxes or whatever, would they bring up any text information so as to make it as, as accessible as possible for those of us who are unable to physically see the maps? Uh, in terms of accessibility, it's I suppose our website has developed to accessibility guidelines. And do you know, I, I'm not an expert, and I apologize if that is not usable to everybody. Um, it, it brings up text. I'm not sure how that functions with screen readers. It does, when you type in text, it brings you a drop down of the options for you to click on. Um, I can certainly look into that further in terms of the, how that functions with accessibility. Um, Personally, it's not my area it's of expertise. But something like browse allowed, maybe, Diane? No, 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 I, no. no, I use specialist assistive technology. Okay. I use a screen reader on my computer. But what I'm saying is that when you pull those drop-down boxes down and you're actually clicking through the use of your assistive technology on those various items that are text-based, when you finally get to the information that you're looking for, does it read it if it's not a physical map? Uh, do you mean the information on the map? It, it, whether, whether it's the various records or things like that that actually relate to the area that you're looking in. Yeah, it will, I presume it will read the box text, which is if you click on what we classified a point of interest. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think how it will work is, is the, the screen reader should read the box text because that is what has been captured off the map. 
-hmm. There are there will be definitely be other pieces of information on the map which we did not capture as part of the project, mm -hmm. which won't come up or I don't think will come up in the screen reader because you're literally looking at the scanned digitized version of the map. And that is purely because we did not capture the text against all of that. So when we did the project, basically what we did was the, the points of interest are sectioned down into education, um, religion, but under themes. So the bit, for example, that I referenced where I said there's it's the long cash, that's not captured as a point of interest, okay. but it appears on the map. Um, so no, unfortunately that was just part of this, and there is so much information on all of those maps that it would probably be impossible to capture as a whole. But what I, what I have done is brought out the originals, and, and obviously that is not helpful in terms of a screen reader, but I'm not sure what the best point of access is. But I suppose I'm happy to take feedback on that, but just in terms of interpreting what the actual map looks like. The originals are the other option because sometimes it may be easier or, or sort of working with somebody to actually work your way around all of, particularly if you're interested in the finer detail. Yeah. For anybody, you can't search on that intricate detail. You just have to work your way to the map and that is part of the scan document. Without putting you on the spot, Dan, is it something we maybe could follow up with in a conversation with Diane, even to understand Absolutely. a little bit in more terms of, if Diane, you were feedback, willing to, to do it? Yeah, yeah. What would, if there's anything yeah. that we could do to make it more accessible, yeah. I'm just being honest, yes. there is stuff Absolutely. that we just did not capture as part of the project. Yes. That, that there's always, there's always learning going forward even within this project yeah, that doesn't work, so no, that would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No, nothing at the, at the moment. Okay, um, so I would like to introduce Sarah. Um, we're hoping um, the technology is, is going to work here. Um, Sarah McDonough is uh, a PhD student who has been working um, with us, um, PhD student at Queen's has been working with us um, on the Prisons Memory Archive for um, I suppose about six, six months now and um, it was really interesting I think whenever um, we started going through um, this process so Sarah initially came to us to talk to us about um, audio descriptions yeah. and um, we are very interested in how we're going to make the material accessible but what we very quickly realised again is going back this is one of the phrases of today the layers of meaning and um, that we all start to start to put upon them so Sarah's going to go through um, we're going to go through the recordings and then we're going to go um, into uh, some questions as well so Sarah over to you thank you Thank you very much, Lorraine, for the introduction, um, and thank you to um, Peroni for having us all here today, and for the Prison Memories Archive team in general. In general, it's been really great um, being able to work with you in, in making this archive um, more accessible to a wider um, range of audiences. So I'm just going to talk um, today just um, basically about the process of audio describing um, the Maze Longkesh site. Um, just get my slides up here and then I will show you then the audio descriptions that we've done. So, so um, it's, so as Lorraine said in her introduction, I'm a PhD student at Queen's um, University and my research interest lies in the field of audiovisual translation, specifically audio description for blind and practice sighted audiences. So I'd like to start today just by um, describing the, the title slide of this PowerPoint. So um, it's entitled Describing the Maison Kesh. Um, to the right we have a photo, an aerial photo of H blocks, and above um, the title of the slide there's um, an audio description sign um, with three sound waves um, emitted from the cap capital letters A and D, which mean audio description. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Is that okay? Great. Okay, so today um, we're really just going to shine a light on the site footage recordings of the Maze Long Kesh. Um, that include the compounds or cages, the H blocks and the hospital. And these clips are audio described. So for those who are unfamiliar with audio description, um, it is an assistive tool which provides a spoken description of visual information. And it's available in film, 
television, theatre and performing arts venues. Um, so now while audio description is primarily used by blind and partially sighted audiences, um, its use actually extends far beyond this group of users. For example, audio description has been applied to museums, um, guiding the general public through art exhibitions and uh, collections, offering additional information about the piece of art or artist. So, in a similar vein today, um, the audio description for the site footage of the Prison Memories Archive is designed to assist all audiences um, of varying visual abilities, um, guiding them through the space of the Maze Monkesh. Um, and in keeping with today's theme, um, storytelling from conflict, today's audio description will just add another layer of meaning to the site <coughs> itself. So using this as our starting point, I'd just like to take the time now to reflect on the audio description process from a describer's point of view, so from, from my point of view, offering you an insight into the process of audio description. Um, and then we'll play you the audio descriptions. So by the end of today, I hope that you'll gain a bit of insight into how the simple task of describing what you see is actually far more complex than um, it initially appears. So, on this slide, which ties in quite well with Janice's talk, um, we have a visual image of a map of Northern Ireland with a pinpoint on the city of Belfast. So one of the main challenges um, in writing the audio description for the PMA, PMA College concerned the issue of terminology, particularly around the naming of places. So, um, whilst the province is known as Northern Ireland officially, it's commonly referred to as Ulster by some um, unionist and loyalist communities. In contrast, the north of Ireland is generally used by um, Republicans who view it as the part of the rest of the island of Ireland. In a similar vein, the name of the prison itself um, reveals the complexity um, of terminology in um, Northern Ireland. Um, originally known as Long Kesh, the prison was later renamed Her Majesty's Maze Prison. Um, and, however, former prisoners, both Republican and Loyalist, um, still refer to it by its original name of Long Kesh, or the Kesh. Uh, for the purposes of this project, we um, integrated and incorporated both names of the prison, so Maze and Long Kesh, um, to reflect both its official title and its um, unofficial title used by prisoners. Equally, by including both names of Maze Long Kesh, we can trace really the development of the site from an internment camp to then the cellular structure of the H-blocks. Um, we also use the official name of the compounds alongside its unofficial name of the cages, uh, which was used by prisoners. So whilst these are just two examples, um, they really reflect a broader point on how words can function beyond mere geographical pinpoints in the context of Northern Ireland. Um, rather, they can be taken to be indicators of religious, social, political, cultural um, ideologies of those that use them. Um, equally, by simply describing one detail over another, we are subject to some form of selection bias, which prioritises one narrative, one story, one perspective over another. For example, the hospital is a site which is typically associated with uh, the hunger strikes. And while the presence of the hospital has a heightened significance for uh, Republicans, it has been a sort of sense, um, caused a sense of deep discomfort for others. With this in mind then, the technical issues um, and the terms that we use in the audio description um, takes on really an ethical dimension that um, influences representations of um, history, memories, um, identities. Another important point to raise is the issue of accuracy in describing the space itself. Being unfamiliar with the site, um, I relied on the testimonies of others who were actually there to inform the audio description. So by collaborating and working, talking to participants from the Prison Memories Archive management team, um, I could ensure that the audio description was in keeping um, with their experiences of the site. So, on this slide we have um, two photos, um, side by side. So on the left we have the inside of a Nissen hut in the cages or compounds. Um, the photo on the left shows the inside of the hut when it was still in use. Um, it's sectioned off into individual cubicles. Um, the photo on the right, um, show, in contrast, shows the inside of the Nissen hut from the Prison Memories Archive site footage. So you can see the difference um, in terms of the state of the site. Um, while both photos show the inside of the Nissen hut, they represent a different period in time. 
And this is something which is quite interesting and difficult and challenging for me, was um, recognizing that the site has invariably changed over time. And depending on the period of time, the prison evolved according to the penal regime that was in place. So for example, prisoners um, or ex-prisoners were subjected to uh, different penal regimes um, at different periods of time. So for example, internment to criminalization uh, to the acceptance of political status at the later stages of the prison. And describing the prison as it is in the recordings to how it was for those who were there has posed a real challenge. So while the site footage shows a crumbling prison site, um, testimonies from those who were there um, really um, adds a personal perspective on the prison and kind of breathes a new life into the space. So for example, an empty rectangular room becomes a canteen where prisoners would have met, ate together and talked to one another. An empty office becomes the governor's office, which would have controlled the day-to-day -day running of the prison. So we try to bridge this gap, building up the picture of the prison site as it was then, to how it is in the footage, based on the experiences of those that who were, who were there. So, um, bearing this in mind, you might ask how can we strike a balance in describing a place such as the Maison Kesh, a place which means many different things to many different people. Um, additionally, how can the audio description reflect or even replicate the inclusive nature of the Prison Mary's archive? Um, one which includes the stories from a wide range of perspectives, so from prison staff um, to prisoners themselves to visitors, educators, chaplains, to name but a few. Um, bearing this in mind, um, and in keeping with um, the Prison Memories um, Archive ethical framework, we try to involve some participants in the initial scripting stages of the audio description. Um, so they took on an advisory role, sort of informing the audio description and um, having some input into the editorial decisions of the audio description script. Um, so I've moved to this slide now. Um, so in this slide we have a black and white image of sound waves emitting from the mouth of a person. Sorry, I'll just get some water. So given that audio description is written to be spoken, the issue of how to voice it is um, something which has raised questions over the notions of language, um, which include accent, and um, one that's bound up in kind of cultural and political identities in the context of Northern Ireland. So traditionally, UK describers are encouraged to have a particular neutral way of speaking, known as received pronunciation, or RP. Um, indeed, this tone has been taken to be uh, the norm in audio description more generally. However, given the nature and the subject matter of the PMA, an RP accent might perhaps be less well received in the context of Northern Ireland. So how do you voice um, the audio description in a society such as Northern Ireland where accent can be taken to be a key indicator of one's um, social and cultural background? Well, for the descriptions, we chose two voices um, from Northern Ireland, one male and one female. Um, the decision to include a female voice was a deliberate one. Um, one which challenges the predominant um, narrative of the Troubles as an exclusively male conflict. Um, the inclusion of a female voice in the audio description challenges this assumption, recognising women's roles within the conflict. So today really i am just discussed just some initial observations that I've had by producing this audio description and um, it's really a work in progress and we really, really would like to have um, get your feedback on it. Um, which hopefully you can do in the workshop. And I hope that I've left you with some sort of food for thought um, to discuss further in the workshop element um, about the complexities of describing um, the Maze Long Cash site. And thank you very much for your attention. And I hope to maybe speak to some of you at a later stage today. And I will show you the audio descriptions now as well. So. So this is the um, compounds or cages. 
originally used for military purposes during the Second World War, the compounds, or cages as they were known to prisoners, were first introduced as a temporary solution to the increasing prison population following the introduction of internment in 1971 by the then ruling Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, along with the backing of the British government. Encased in wire fencing, the cages were arranged four huts side by side, with one hut per cage used as a canteen, and the other three as living quarters. The prisoners were packed in, 40 per hut, sleeping on bunk beds, one on top of the other. Not weatherproof, the huts were stuffy in the summer and freezing in the winter. Mostly self-governing, each cage was divided by political affiliation and was overseen by a commanding officer. The communal nature of imprisonment in the cages meant that prisoners could organise and protest against their poor living conditions, eventually leading to the burning of a part of the camp in 1974 by IRA prisoners. After the construction of the H blocks between 1975 and 1978, the cages were eventually phased out, with the last prisoners transferred to this new cellular structure in 1988. Now, years later, the cages have slowly fallen into disrepair and serve as a reminder of a different time in our history. An old, derelict prison yard, thick with brambles and moss. Shrouded by the steadily advancing overgrowth, two dilapidated wooden huts are at the far end of the yard. An old Nissan hut. It is a crumbling structure with a low, rounded roof set against a black brick base. The hut has the appearance of abandoned prisoner of war camp. Broken furniture lies overturned at the entrance, which is obscured by an overgrown tree. Bars are fitted to the window. Inside the hut is an open plan, sparsely furnished communal area with a shabby wooden counter in the centre of the room. The roof, which is painted cream, curves down to the tiled floor. A narrow corridor leads to two additional rooms. Behind us there is a longer corridor leading to another two rooms to the right of the building. The leaves have blown in from the open door at the far end of this corridor. Another section of the hut. It is open plan with no furniture except for a large white bag at the far end of the room. The outside door is ajar. Outside, a pile of rubble lies by the wire perimeter fence which separates this cage from another. A long wooden rectangular outbuilding of peeling paint. Farther on, there is another pile of rubble which sits beside the charred remains of a Nissan hut. Beyond this is another wire perimeter fence. Through the fence into another cage is a Nissan hut. Peering through rusted prison bars, the inside is sectioned off into individual cubicles. These cubicles line either side of the space. A large blue screen separates each. The midsection of the hut reveals the inside of each cubicle. There is a small separate room at the entrance to the hut. The remaining cubicle walls are different colours, some brown, others blue. A broken window hangs open. Time and neglect have reduced this building to a state of deterioration and disrepair. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the, um, the heat blocks now. I should mention as well that um, before each clip there's an audio introduction, which just kind of provides some contextual information. Um, that's why it was paused. Built over a period of three years, from 1975 to 1978, the H blocks, eight in total, were based on a cellular system designed in the shape of an H, with four radiating wings perpendicular to the central administrative area, commonly known as the circle. The construction of the H blocks was seen as an attempt by authorities to reassert control over a prison population that had led a series of protests and prison escapes. The introduction of the H blocks in 1975 coincided with the withdrawal of special category status to political prisoners. Designed to limit the free political association that was common to the prisoners of the cages, movement within the blocks was strictly controlled with extensive security mechanisms in each section of the wing. In contrast to the freedom of the cages, the isolation in the blocks was palpable. Individual cells measured roughly eight by seven feet, with usually two men to a cell. The policy to treat political prisoners just like any other meant resistance, not only from Republicans, but also from loyalists. Those serving conflict-related charges were expected to conform to normal prison rules. 
When they arrived at the H blocks, several political prisoners refused to put on their uniforms, and so began the blanket protests, later escalating to the no wash protests in 1978, and eventually culminating in the hunger strikes of 1980 and 1981. While prisoners openly rebelled and protested against their living conditions, the prison staff too faced their own challenges with long working hours, understaffing, together with the threat of violence and intimidation from prisoners. Indeed, over the course of the history of the maze, Long Kesh, 29 prison staff were murdered, with many others taking their own lives. Now, years later, the stories of the maze Long Kesh mirrors those of the armed conflict that took place both inside and outside of its walls. A wide panoramic view of the entire maze Long Kesh prison site, with its extensive concrete walls, wire fences, exercise yards, admin buildings and age blocks, the prison appears, at least initially, totally grey. The internal security gate. It is a heavily fortified barrier with coiled barbed wire fencing, security cameras and spotlights. The entrance to H4. It is a single storey, flat roof, concrete building. Moving inside and through a set of metal grills, we enter into the central administrative area of the H block, known as the Circle. Despite its name, the circle is rectangular in shape. Across the hallway, an old rusted metal frame of a patient's trolley is abandoned outside a room. Passing this, we enter into the medical room. The room is equipped with a brown examination bed, metal scales, desk, toilet cubicle, sink and cabinets. We exit this room, moving across the circle. We enter into a small kitchen unit, which was used by prison officers. Fallen debris from the ceiling is strewn across the floor of the kitchen. Leaving the kitchen, we enter the governor's office. Like the previous room, fallen debris from the ceiling has left what was once a place of order, now in complete disarray, with abandoned paperwork scattered on the tables and floor. Leaving this room, we move on to the prison wing, which is broken up by three sets of grills at intervening sections of the corridor. These gates would have been airlocked, meaning the first gates had to be shut before the second would open. We move past the first set, onto the second, and then the third. At the end of this corridor, there are two entrances for wing C on the left and wing D on the right. We turn left onto wing C. Ahead, a pearly lit prison wing extends out ahead of us. The walls are beige, the floor black. We enter into the prison's washroom, or ablutions. The entrance is fitted with plastic screens, offering some privacy. We return back onto the wing. We pass another set of grills to the right. Rows of heavy prison doors line the length of the corridor. Each door is fitted with a peephole or observational slit and lock which would have been controlled externally by the prison officers. We enter into a moderately sized room which would have been a larger prison cell. Functional chairs are stacked one on top of the other in the corner. Thick vertical concrete bars have been integrated into the windows. We return back onto the wing. A small prison cell which is sparsely furnished with a single bed frame, mattress, table and chair. Each of the 24 cells on the wing mimics this basic structure. In another cell, an unlocked heating pipe runs the length of the room, which was used by prisoners to communicate with each other.
Graffiti on the wall of another cell reads UFF, referring to the Ulster Freedom Fighters, a loyalist paramilitary group. The relentlessly functional space of the prison cells reflected the overall prison structure that sought to isolate and separate prisoners, functioning as a prison within a prison. As we move along the prison wing, each cell is in different states of disrepair. In another cell, a curtain lies discarded on the bed. Dull and indistinctive, this small cube-like cell does not give much away about the identity or political allegiance of its previous occupants. We continue to the end of the wing, exiting out onto a small tarmac yard. Coiled barbed wire has fallen down from the top of the fence and onto the tarmac. There are two security gates to the right and the left of the yard. We turn to the left gate, made of grey corrugated steel. Once through, we enter into a much bigger prison yard. At the far end of this yard is another security fence and gate. Okay. And finally, we have the hospital. Located on the southwest side of the prison, the hospital uses the same basic structure and concrete materials of the H blocks. It comprises a central administrative area with two wings radiating out on either side, with single cells arranged alongside one another, similar to those in the H blocks. Like the H blocks, the hospital is a functional space with little decoration. For many, the hospital has become synonymous with the hunger strikes of 1981, in which Republican prisoners protested the withdrawal of political status and which would eventually lead to the deaths of 10 men. While the presence of the hospital has a heightened sense of significance for Republicans, for others it has been a source of deep discomfort. The hospital continued to operate following the hunger strikes, treating prisoners for minor injuries and illnesses until the prison's closure in the year 2000. In the intervening years, the legacy of the hospital remains a symbol of how post-conflict society comes to terms with its past and negotiates its future. A single-story flat roof building, blue grills stand out against an otherwise grey exterior. Moving inside and through two sets of white metal grills, we enter into the circle. Crossing this, we pass through another set of grills into the hospital's control room. A small sink unit is at the far end of the room. All disused electronic equipment and switchboards which would have controlled the day-to-day -day security of the hospital are situated next to the door. We leave the control room, returning to the circle. We pass through an old medicine trolley and move through a wooden door into an empty room. The floor is grey, the walls are faded green. There are visible signs of decay here. Damp has caused the paint on the walls to crack. We exit, turning left onto the hospital wing, through another set of prison grills, past a small sink unit, drawers, medicine cabinets, and a wall-mounted wooden desk. The hospital wing extends out ahead of us. Off the wing, we enter a large, empty, rectangular room. At one point in the history of the hospital, this room would have served as a canteen for prisoners. We leave and move across the hallway into a similarly sized room with a large pool table in the middle. Its vibrant green base jars with the greyness of the room. We move across the wing into a small kitchen complete with a steel sink, draining boards, white storage cabinets and kitchen worktop. In the far corner there is an old-fashioned four-hob gas cooker. Thick vertical concrete bars have been integrated into the window frame. We leave here and enter the toilets where there are three empty toilet cubicles. Moving on, we examine the inside of the slot pot, which is used to get rid of prisoners' waste after lockup. Further along the wing, there is another bathroom with a shower unit, bath, toilet, and sink used to bathe patients. We move down the wing and pause for a moment before entering cell number 8. 
a single metal bed frame stripped of its mattress as the only furniture. The cell is unremarkable, yet has become deeply connected to the story of the previous occupant, Bobby Sands. Sands died here on the 5th of May 1981, after 66 days on hunger strike. We leave this room and move into the neighbouring cell, where there is an identical metal bed frame in the middle of the room. Purely functional, its contents are the same as each cell along the wing. Across the hospital wing, we enter into cell number 5. Over the years, the hospital treated prisoners for a wide range of conditions, from minor ailments and injuries to more serious health issues related to the hunger strikes. We leave cell 5 and continue down the hospital wing towards the end of the corridor, entering cell number 4. Here, there is a door which leads to an adjoining toilet. The impact of years of neglect and decay are increasingly noticeable as we pass from cell to cell. Damp has damaged most of the cells, creating a patchwork of mould that is spread across the walls. We enter into the final cell in this wing, cell number one. Inside it is concrete, grey and utilitarian, with little decoration. <coughs> The curtain hangs partially torn from the rail of the bar window. We return onto the hospital wing. <coughs> Moving back towards the main entrance, we pass each cell again. Rows of heavy set, angular, metal prison doors line the length of the corridor. Like the H blocks, each cell door is fitted with an observation slit and is locked externally. past the old abandoned medicine cart. We return to the entrance of the hospital wing and back to the circle. Okay, so that, those are all the clips. Um, I should just mention now that we have the workshop element um, and